126. It's going to be right in the middle of your Bible. Just a short little song, right? Psalm 126. <laughs> Starting in verse 1, it says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. When was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing? Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Amen. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Pastor Doug, you pray for us this morning. Amen. Father, we come for us today. Thank you, Father, for this time we gather together, for this time of reading of the word. We pray the Lord that men here on this time. Give us a word of the word that you can speak for us. Amen. 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 All right. I don't my sermon this morning is going forth and weeping. Going forth and weeping. And you know, as a Christian in this day and age, you know, we need to have a burden for the lost. We need to have a burden and a conviction and a drive, a burning fire in our heart this morning for the lost to be burdened for them to see them, to get saved yeah. by calling upon the name of the Lord in prayer that they might be saved this morning. Yeah. You know, if we don't have a burden for the lost, you know, there's something wrong with us this morning. Amen. Amen. That's our sole reason for being here on this earth. You know, once we get saved and put our trust on Christ, He doesn't just rapture us out of here, you know, our clothes fall to the ground and we disappear. No, He has a specific purpose for us here on this earth. Yeah. And that's to preach for lost souls that, that they might be saved also with the bring them with us to heaven yeah. one day. Yeah. Right? So Christians, our primary reason on earth is to proclaim the gospel to every creature. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? So God wants us to have a burden for the lost. He wants us to sow in tears, and when we sow in tears, we shall reap in joy. Amen. To go forth and weep, to have that burning desire in our heart to see lost souls come to salvation. Right? You know, Jesus talks about how he'll leave the flock for just the one. We need to follow that example and just seek. You know, Jesus came to seek and save, which was lost when he came here the first time. Right? Amen. We need to follow that example if we're to be Christ like. Right? In our Christian walk. You know, this sermon, I got this idea in my head, you know, at church, at All Scripture Baptist Church, we had a soul winning marathon out in Clint. We do these little small town daily uh, marathons where we just, you know, go up and knock doors and we preach the gospel to people. And uh, we went to a trailer park or something, right? And Pat Mays, he came with us. And, and Deacon Aaron Taylor, he was with me. You know, it wasn't a very receptive area, but we got to this one door, this little old lady, right? And we're just preaching, and, and we're, we're opening up the scriptures for almost the better part of two hours to her, right? And she's just not getting it, right? She just rejects it outright at the end. You know, she just she doesn't see she doesn't see the need to, to call upon the name of the Lord to save her, right? And and, and that, that that just tore me to pieces, right? You know, just I shed tears for that lady later that night, right? You know, cause, because. You want to just shake them, right? You want to just make them get yeah. saved if you could somehow do it. But, you know, we as as people today, we have the free agency. We have the free will to either believe God's perfect sacrifice or we can reject that, right? Yeah. Because of pride, ultimately, yeah. it's the biggest thing that gets in our way, right? We don't want to humble ourselves yeah. to where we recognize that we need him, right? So that's that's what kind of prompted this message is, is just that, that sorrow for the lost, yeah. that burden for the Right, we need to have that in our lives. It'll change our Christian life when we realize yeah. Yeah. the value of one soul. You know, the Bible talks about how the value of one soul is greater than the pride of the eye, mm -hmm. you know, the lust of the flesh, everything this world has to offer, all the stones and the precious gems and gold and silver and all the cars and houses and buildings. One human soul is greater than all of it combined, greater than all of creation. Amen. Right? Amen. Jesus Amen. says, What profit did a man if he lose? He, you know, he gave the whole world and he loses his soul. Yeah. What's the point? Yep. What's the point? 
So, going forth and weeping. Why should we have a burden for the lost this morning? Number one, because God wants us to be burdened. God wants yeah. us to be burdened. God has an earnest, God desires an earnest and sincere servant, and he desires us to have this same attitude outlined here in Psalm 126, that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bring his sheaves with him. God wants us to weep and be burdened for the lost sinners today, just as he does. Jesus wept for lost sinners. Jesus loved lost sinners. He says, you know, he died not for just our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you, Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. We need to have a burden for the lost this morning. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. You know, take a look at yourself and ask yourself this morning, where is your heart this morning? Where is your focus, right? Where is your treasure stored up, right? You're with me here in Matthew chapter 6. In verse 19, it reads, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? You know, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he's going to re he's going to reward every man according to his works. The Bible says, right? And, and our focus this morning, rather than the corporeal, than the temporal things that we can see with our own eyes, our focus should be on eternity in heaven forevermore. Yeah. That is what truly matters. That is what's going to last this morning. All your possessions, all your boats, all your 401k and your retirement. And all this, your social security, it's all for naught. It's all going to pass away. Amen. What matters is the value of one lost soul Amen. that they pray for minutes and believe and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's more Amen. powerful. That's more precious. That's more priceless than anything this world has to offer us this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's lay up our treasures in heaven. What, what, what's he saying you're laying up our treasures in heaven, right? And, and the Bible says that the Lord's going to reward every man according to his works. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Right? What he's saying is he wants our focus to be on eternity. He wants our focus to be on the spiritual things. You know, the things that really matter that are going to last the fire, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I wasn't even intending to go here. It's just kind of how it worked out in my sermon plan last night. I studied and I just saw a lot in this and just thought it was an awesome chapter. I wanted you to see this too. So number two, why does God want us to have a burden for the lost? Because he's going to reward every man according to his works. All right, let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 5, it says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? Even as the Lord gave to every man. Stop right there for a second. Every man, it says, has a minister by whom they may or may not believe. Just as Pastor Doug Fielden was the minister by which I got saved and I was spiritually begotten of the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ has appointed a minister, an humble servant for every man that they might call upon the name of the Lord and be mm -hmm. saved this yeah. morning. Amen. Verse 6. It says, I have planted, Paul speaking of himself, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So then neither is he that planteth anything, right. neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Amen. Right? Amen. It's God who saved us. 
we're out laboring in the fields. One of us, we might plant the seed. Apollos might come on later down the road, maybe even years or decades later, and water the seed and it come to fruition and that person gets saved. But it's God that gives the increase Amen. in every single one of these scenarios. Amen. For we are laborers together with God, in verse 9. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, yeah. the Bible says. Now, now jump down just a few verses to verse 12. It's a very interesting pas uh, passage in 1 Corinthians 3 here. Verse 12, it says, Now if any man build upon his foundation, all right, that foundation being Jesus Christ, right? There's no other foundation but the rock of Jesus. Right. Now it's talking about us building upon that foundation of Jesus, right? In our Christian lives. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, mm -hmm. and the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. If any, man, if any man's works abide, which he hath built thereupon, then he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet is so by fire. So let's look at this. What is it talking about when it says the gold, silver, the precious stones, the wood, hay, and the stubble? Well, this is talking about, in God's eyes, you have different degrees of labors or works for the Lord in God's kingdom, all right? And look at this. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. You know, even the wood, hay, stubble. All of these things have practical use. Right? You know, we, we use wood and hay and stubble. We use the hay and stubble to feed our livestock and in farming and in agriculture. You know, you're, you'll use wood to build a house, right? Mm -hmm. All these things have practical use. But then you have the finer things, the more precious and valuable things in God's eyes. You have gold, silver, and precious stones. And what God is saying here is when they're tried by fire, some of these things will be burnt up. When God judges us according to our works, you know, he's going to judge the unrighteous and the workers of iniquity by their sins, right? By their evil works. He's going to judge us, the righteous, the born again saved believers, by our good works in service to Jesus Christ with gladness of heart. He's saying here, when they're tried by the fire, these gold, silver, and precious stones, they're going to last more than anything else, right? But even if your works are of wood, hay, or stubble, right? He's saying if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. Just further proving, salvation is nothing but a free gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. But then it goes on in Ephesians 2.10, how we are God's craftsmanship and appointed unto good works within our salvation. So, Gold, silver, and precious stones. These are the more valuable works in God's eyes. The eternal things, the spiritual things that are going to last. Mm -hmm. Getting people saved, right? Fulfilling the Great Commission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, right? Mm -hmm. Teaching them in all ways of righteousness and all manner of truth. This is what God values more than anything in our daily Christian lives. That was the first thing he instituted when he set up his church before he left. He told us to go and preach the gospel to every preacher, thus Amen. saith the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Your wood, hay, and stubble. These could be anything from, you know, your own personal ministry, like in, in your job or your career, or, or, you know, just trying to lead a, a clean, decent life. Uh, you know, all these churches nowadays, they have... It's, it's like they've gotten their focus on everything but preaching the gospel. I mean, and don't mistake me for what I'm saying here. You know, there's value in having your clothes hampers and digging your wells and, and having your food pantries and all these things. But people today, they're, they're just, it's like they've got a tunnel vision. They're in this mindset where they would rather fulfill the carnal needs, the yeah. temporal yeah. needs of the yeah. flesh, yeah. rather than the spiritual yeah. needs. Within them, yeah. they'd rather give them 
the carnal water that's going to fade and burn up one day rather than the water of life that Jesus talks about. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me, yeah, excuse me. He says, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Once they taste of that bread of life, once they taste of that water of life, they're never going to want for salvation again. Because once we're saved, we're always saved. Right? Amen. We're born again in a moment, right? Born of the Spirit, right? You're born in a moment fleshly. You're born in a moment spiritually. It's not some long, drawn-out process of your whole life like they try and make it to teach it nowadays. By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are born again into his family as the Son of God. And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name this morning. So look, there's nothing wrong with your food pantry. I'm not talking your food pantry or your clothes basket, right? Feeding the homeless, all these things. But use it as a means to preach the gospel to them. Right? Use that as a vehicle, right? Use that to bring them in, get their attention, and say, hey, I've clothed you, I've fed you, I've gave you raiment. But there's more important than this temporal water. There's more important than this temporal food, right? There's more important than this earthly raiment. You need that spiritual raiment. The, the, the robes, the garments of salvation, that robe of Christ's righteousness got upon you to the salvation of your soul this morning. That, that should be our focus this morning. Like I said, you can have your food pantry. You can, we have all these missionaries, and they spend so millions of dollars on these missionaries that go over to these overseas countries, and they ain't even done a bit of soul winning in their own country. Amen. And they want you to pay them money to go and sit on their butt over on the other side of the world and say, oh, well, well I dug a well, right? Well, how did you get saved? Who says? Right? Go dig your well. There's nothing wrong with that. But use it to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Use it to say, hey, here's the water of life. Right? But look, we labor for the Lord with sincerity and earnest of heart. He's going to reward every man according to his works, as the Bible says. Yep. You're back here in Psalm 126, okay? Psalm 126. So, number one. Why should we have a burden for the lost? Because God expects us to, as outlined in this passage. Number two, because he's going to reward us according to our works. Right? As it says in verse 5, they that sow in tears, they shall reap in joy on that glorious day once it's all over. And just, just imagine that, right? You know, you, we go through trials and tribulations in this earth, right? And just imagine the joy of that moment. Not only do you get to see your precious Savior who paid and died for all your sins, right? But you also get to see the faces of the people you brought along with you. The faces of the people that you've ministered to, right? That, that you preached in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they call upon the name of the Lord in prayer. And they say, thank you, Brother Caleb. Thank you, Pastor Doug Fielden, for preaching me the word of God that I might be convicted and feel that reproval of the Holy Spirit in my heart and realize my name for a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. Bless his name forevermore that I might call upon his name and be spiritually born again forevermore. Amen. Imagine that moment. Imagine that moment in heaven. Seeing the people. Seeing the people that we've preached to. That they get saved. Look there in verse number six. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All right, verse number six. We are to go forth with a burden for the lost this morning, people. We are to seek the lost, bearing the precious seed. You might ask yourself, what is the precious seed? What is he talking about? Well, let's, well let me show you. Go to Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter 8, early in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. We're just going to read a verse here. Chapter 
8, verse 11. And it says, speaking of the parable, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, right? So this precious seed, precious more than every, anything in this world, he's talking about the word of God. He's talking about the preached word of God, as it says in Romans 10, 9, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. This is the precious seed. Mm -hmm. God wants us to have the precious seed, the word of God, deep within our hearts, meditating on it day and night, that it be fresh and ever precious and present in our mind yes. and going forth into the fields that are ripe for harvest, as he says in John chapter 4, and preach and proclaim and sow that seeds into the hearts of men that they might come to fruition, he says it. Yeah. Yeah. As we just saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, they might not get saved if you preach to them. But you at least plant that seed there. Right? right? You know, and I, I was thinking we were out soul winning me and my friend Marcus the other night uh, on Wednesday. And we knocked on this, this lady's door. She said, well, I appreciate you, but I really don't have time right now. I'm just very busy. Right? I said, well, okay. Can I just leave you with one verse? I said, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. And I just quickly expounded it to her. I said, Salvation is nothing but a free gift of God, and we receive it by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's not of anything you or I can do, and it's not for us. It's just a free gift, and we have to believe on it. She said to me, it's like she was caught off guard. She said, You know what? I really needed to hear that. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bless you, Lord. Amen. I might never see that woman again in my life. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Look, there's effects we have in our soul winning. Even if we don't get a person saved, there's effects mm -hmm. that we can't even begin to imagine that it might have years, Amen. weeks, you know, months, Amen. decades down the road. Right? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 11 30 says, For the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise, mm -hmm. right? And we'll get into that in a moment. But look, you don't know, right? Our job isn't to get people saved. Yes, people will get saved by our preaching. Our job is to preach, mm -hmm. first and foremost, mm -hmm. right? Whether you want to believe on it or not, that's not up to me, that's up to you. But I'm going to fulfill my job of at least preaching to them, all right? So, saw that there in Luke chapter 8. So why should we go forth and weep? Number one, God expects us to. Number two, God will reward us according to our works. Number three, because Jesus himself wept for the lost. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus himself wept for the lost. Let's go back to Luke. We're going to be in Luke a little bit. Luke chapter 19. Okay? Luke chapter 19. And just, I should have told you a second ago, but just kind of if you have a bookmark or a pen or something, just leave it there in Luke because... We're going to flip through there a little bit throughout this sermon. Luke chapter 19. Verse 41. See, Jesus wept for the lost. Jesus loved the lost. He cared for the lost. Mm -hmm. And if we're to be Christ-like, we need to follow his example. You know, down to the very iota, right, of what he did. Because he, he burdened and was heavy for the lost, we should be good. It says here in verse 41, chapter 19, it's start talking about Jesus going up to the city of Jerusalem, right? And he when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the thing which belonged unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep, they, keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So Jesus, you know, of course he's prophesying and speaking of the events that would take place in AD 70 when the Romans would lay siege on Jerusalem 
and just completely demolish the city and leave no stone unturned, right? But get this. Jesus, he's not crying over some buildings being demolished or falling down, right? Look at what he says here. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The Bible says Jesus came to his own and his own received him not, right? He's not crying over the buildings that they're going to be destroyed. He's not crying about the curse that's going to come upon Jerusalem. He's crying because when he sees these buildings, when he sees these lights within the windows, he knows that that, that symbolizes one or several people within each and every single one of those buildings who need eternal life, who need to be saved. Amen. Jesus preached. He came to die for everyone, even the ones that he knew would reject him. And it saddened him. It saddened him. He cried. He wept for the lost when they wouldn't receive him. When they would, when they would reject him. You know, he's not this cold, mean Calvinist God that only dies for the saved or the elect. Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, right. and all means all. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus Christ died for every man, including the lost that would reject him. Yeah. Sure. And he was sad by it. He wept about it. Flip just a page over, one or two pages to Luke 22. Jesus Christ gave us the perfect example of how we should have a relationship with the lost and the lost. Look here, in chapter 22, there in uh, verse 39, he's talking about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was to be uh, lifted up, speaking of the manner of his death. Verse 39, and he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was out the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not thy will, but thine own be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And look at this, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus is in agony. He's agonizing, he's in pain, he's in torment, knowing what he's about to go through and experience. And he went through it all for you and I. He went through it for the sins of the whole world, for every single man. Every single man and woman that's ever been born upon this earth, he died for every single one of them. He was there in agony, pleading with God, praying to give him enough strength to fulfill it. Jesus loved us that much. He's literally sweating great drops of blood. Now, we can't even begin to imagine that. You're under so much duress and stress that you're sweating blood from your pores. And get this. Look at what he says to his disciples. And we can look at this. And said unto them in verse 46, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter temptation. So he's here agonizing, praying over the lost, praying over what's to come. And his servants, they couldn't even be bothered. They're just over here taking a nap, right? Mm -hmm. Just taking a little snooze. Right? <laughs> we can get like that ourselves in our Christian lives, right? Mm -hmm. Where we just, you know, throw in the towel and I don't really feel like it today, God. I'm just gonna walk with the flesh, right? <laughs> I don't really feel like preaching the gospel, God. I'm just gonna sit at home and play video games today, right? We can fall in temptation if we're not if we're not vigilant, right? If we're not on our guard. Right? God wants us to be awake and laboring him, with him, alongside him, grueling in agony for the lost, going forth and weeping alongside him for the lost's sake. He came as a suffering servant and ministering to them that which was lost, right? We should follow that example. We can, we can humble ourselves and be that servant for someone else, right? Yeah. Just as it said in 1 Corinthians 3, you know, I was just but a preacher by which you believe, right? We can be that for someone else in our lives. Just as Pastor Doug was that minister for me in my life, 
We can take that example and we can go be that for some other lost person. Right. Yeah. right. It's up to us, right? We can fall asleep or we can be there right next to him praying on our knees. All right. Like I said, just kind of keep your space there in, in Luke because, like I said, we've kind of been there a lot today. And some of you, you know, you might be thinking, yourself, Preacher, I don't like this kind of sermon because it makes me feel guilty about what, I, what I'm not doing. Well, good. That's the whole point of the sermon, right? We're to come to church to hear the admonitions of God's word. Amen. And to just, it, it, we can either harden our heart in the face of that, yeah. or we can, you know, get down on our knees and say, God, forgive me. I should be doing better. And we can receive those admonitions with gladness and with humbleness. And we can apply them to our lives to be better Christians day to day, right? Ain't nothing wrong with stepping on your toes a little bit, though, man. It's going to be all right. If we are to be truly Christ-like in our lives, okay, you know, we should have a, a deep care for the lost, just as Jesus did in these, in these several passages, right? So, number one, God expects us to have a burden for the lost. Two, he's going to re reward us for our works. And three, Jesus wept for the lost in the cell, right? These are three good enough reasons already. Here's another reason. Four, because hell is real. Hell is as real today as it was 2,000 years ago. We need to realize, people, that just in the span of this sermon so far, there have been people that have gotten car wrecks and died and went to hell. Right? There's people in hospitals that have breathed their last breath and have went to hell. Right? People have died and went to hell just in the last 30 minutes. There are people dying each and every day that are going to hell. And unless we go out there and bear that precious seed with a tear in our eye, they're going to split hell wide open unless they have a preacher to go and say, Hey, you don't have to go there, young man or young woman or old man or old woman. That's right. Just go do something well. And if you die without Jesus, then no hope. He is our hope. He is our salvation. Amen. Right? Hell is real, folks. And this should encourage us that much more to win souls for Christ. Okay? Like I said, if you have a place in Luke, go to Luke 16. And you know, you have gainsayers. Me and Pastor Allen had to find out this the other week. You know, you have gainsayers. who say, oh, it's all when it doesn't work, preacher. Go and knock on people's doors, that's crazy. That doesn't work. Soul winning always works. It must work. It has to work. If it doesn't work, then the Bible isn't true. If, the, if it doesn't work, then the gospel has lost its power. Gospel has lost its power. Amen. That's right. The Bible is still true. That's right. If anyone's on new life, 